And we are up to uh, uh, the moment we have all been waiting for. Dr. D'Angelo is certainly not a stranger to any of our, of our ND attendees. Uh, he is a professor at the University of Georgia. He's the assistant professor of deer ecology and management. Uh, he's actually a PA native, got his uh, bachelor's degree at Penn State, went on to the University of Georgia for his master's and then his PhD, and then stayed there and even did some postdoc work. Uh, before he came back, he worked in Pennsylvania for, for the USDA for a while, uh, ran Minnesota DNR's deer program, ended up back in Georgia, uh, teaching there at the university, and I know it's one of the top wildlife programs in the country. Uh, they were certainly glad to, to get him uh, on the faculty there. Uh, Gino has written for, for quality white tails for us. He has spoken at our national conventions. He spoke at deer steward classes for us and uh, is just a tremendous friend of the organization. So uh, we are super, super excited to have you here tonight. Uh, cool topic that you have here, Gino. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead. I will turn it over to you, let you take it away. Thanks so much, Kip. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And does that look all right, Kip? That looks good. I think you start your first slide and you'll be all set. You got it. Perfect. Very good. Well, hey, everyone. I love everything NDA and deer related. So it's great to be here with you this evening. As you can see, I'm at my office at the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia. Beer is permitted here. You know, we have a top ranked football team, but I, I don't, I'm not partying here at my desk tonight. I hope you all are and, and you're enjoying the evening. Um, what I'm gonna talk about today is what the future essentially of wildlife management looks like. And despite my good looks, you know, some people say I look like Matt Ross. Um, I'm not what the future of wildlife management looks like. And many of you, I'm just guessing, I can't see you, but likely or not either. We're drawing people from very diverse backgrounds, both from ethnic backgrounds regionally their interests are, are many uh, are, are much different than what we've seen in the past. They're not bub out on the tractor anymore, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. But I'm here at the university to ensure that we've got an effective ne next class of biologists coming out to manage our resources. This photograph that you see here is from our annual deer lab rabbit hunt at the University of Georgia. You can see my pack of hounds so I can check the box that I've gotten my dogs that are very important to me in my presentation. But what you also see, and it's difficult because this was our COVID hunt, we weren't sure how dangerous it was to breathe the air even outside. We had our masks on, but there are a lot of smiling faces there. And these students are out on a wet, rainy day for a couple of reasons. Camaraderie, you know, breaking bread together, enjoying a sport together, experiencing a form of hunting, that none of them had ever experienced hunting with hounds before. Some hunted, some didn't, but this was a new experience for them to see management in action, see what kind of habitats prosper rabbit populations. And also what you'll notice in this photograph is to the far right, we've got Dr. Larry Marchington, Miss Betty Marchington, who are titans of deer research. They're the grandparents of deer research, especially here at University of Georgia. Right next to them, that smiling fellow is Dr. John Kilgo. He's done some groundbreaking research on fawn survival, coyote management. And so these students are not out just to have a good time, but subtly they're also expanding branches of their network so that they're enrooted in wildlife management as soon as they, they leave school. And so what we're gonna talk about today is kind of what the current landscape is for people coming into our programs. What do these new biologists look like in terms of their skill sets and their interests? And we're going to look through the eye of my current nine graduate students. I hope that you'll get to know the students a little bit, but really appreciate the variety and quality of research that they're doing. So instead of just talking about one particular research project, I'll quickly move through a number of research projects and hopefully stimulate some discussion and interest. And then finally, I'm going to have a, a, a little call for you. I want you to think about as I speak, who in my family, who do I know at my local hunting club that, you know, maybe they're, they have an interest in wildlife, but they need that little push to get into wildlife management. They don't have to just plant food plots. They don't just have to measure deer antlers. They can be, you know, great coders. They maybe they're in the coding club for their computer club at, at school. Maybe they're great communicators. 
Maybe they like to tinker with things. They've got an engineering interest. We can have all of those people in our field and we need them, people from diverse backgrounds with diverse interests, send them our way and we'd be happy to train them up and have them as our next wildlife biologists. So here in North America, we operate under what's called North American Model of Wildlife Conservation, which is really rooted in a public trust doctrine. And I don't wanna to get too academic for you, but essentially we all own wildlife resources. We're all stewards of the land, water, and animals. And we use this public trust doctrine to kind of calibrate how we educate that next class of managers. We wanna make sure that they understand they work for the people. They manage wildlife resources for the greater good of society. And so when they leave our walls, we want them to understand that man management, use of resources is really important. It's, it is conservation. And so that's what we strive for. For me, I grew up in hunting and fishing, probably like many of you. I mean, it, from day one, I'd run outside in, in my underwear to see what game my dad brought home. Is there a hoof hanging out of the back of the car? Whatever it may be, interested me greatly. It was a part of our everyday lives. You know, a, as a family affair, we not only got to enjoy the outdoors together, but I was also charged with being a steward of the land. We own a little bit of land in Pennsylvania, but just in general, do what's right for the environment and it'll do well for you. So I was instilled very early with the conservation ethic. You see a picture of us here with our tip ups um, in the bucket. We're at Promised Land State Park in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania, a favorite place of my family. That's where I first saw, and I'm sure many of you know him, Dr. Gary Alt speak. He's extremely intelligent and he's as charismatic as the bears that he studies. And I was just enamored with his presentation about black bear biology. It was just a small group too. That's the thing about Gary. He'll talk to thousands of people or he'll talk to five people with the same enthusiasm. And I approached him after his presentation and said, hey, mister, how do I get into this wildlife biology? And he took plenty of time with me to say, hey, stay off the drugs, do well in school, especially science and math and communication. Your writing has got to be good. Your speaking has got to be good and go to Penn State. And so for me, I was set on a mission. It was easy for me. And I sure as heck did step right into Penn State. And at my fingertips were a diverse um, array of opportunities to get involved in wildlife research. Everything from rough grouse to songbirds to white-tailed deer. I was literally like a pig in sloth down in there working with deer every day. And so for me, it was easy because my home state has an excellent institution, but they're honestly few and far between across the United States. We've got very few high quality wildlife programs. Those that do Mississippi State, Texas A&M, you can find them, but not every student has an opportunity to go to an institution like that and have a great um, opportunity to learn from research, to participate in research, to understand what management is. And so we are charged with taking people from across the nation and training them up and being able to put them back there in the real world to work on real world problems. I went on, as Kip said, to work for U.S. Department of Agriculture, mainly managing white-tailed deer populations, as well as in the state of Minnesota, conducting management and research. And what I found was even for me, moving to different regions of the country, it takes a little while to get used to your constituents, to learn how to work with them. Imagine how difficult it is for people that their primary constituents are often hunters. We manage for the greater public. Only 5% of people hunt, but we have a, a, a wide array of stakeholders. But if you can't relate to your primary day-to-day the folks that you work hand in hand with, hunters, you're at a disadvantage. And so we want people to understand that, yes, we work for the, the greater good of American society, but there are certain key stakeholder groups that we're going to work with regularly. We need to understand whether it's agricultural producers, hunters, the general public that likes to watch wildlife. It's very important that we understand diverse viewpoints. And personal experiences, many of those which I mentioned, not just consumptive like hunting, it's important to get out and have those personal experiences so that you can relate to your constituents. 
I sat on many state and federal hiring committees and we would get the cert list, those people that were qualified for a position. And most of them were great scientists and, and, and even some had management experience, but very few had experience in hunting or even an understanding and appreciation for hunting. And so that's one extra piece of academics that we need to instill in folks. And today, the landscape looks a lot different. Most of our students, by and large, you can see here, upwards of over 80% of our students are from urban backgrounds. They have great skills in terms of book knowledge, but very few have had opportunities to experience um, outdoors uh, in, the same, in the same ways that you and I have. Their experiences were um, sometimes just related to what they see, see in their city park or what they saw on Animal Planet. They're interested and passionate in different ways, but I don't mean to disparage them whatsoever. Many of the students that we see, for instance, at University of Georgia, our average GPA, grade point average, is over a 4.0, and their SAT scores are off the charts. And our students come into the university, they've got two years to form a foundation, their basic um, classes, chemistry, math, et cetera, before we see them in our, in our forestry school, where I'm gonna see them in Wildlife 101 and tell them what management is, and it can be shocking for them. But I will say they've got a great foundation and it just takes a little extra stimulation giving them the experiences that I'm talking about for them to get deeply interested in management. Once we expose them to these things, look at taking blood from a coyote for sampling, handling a, a mature buck in our squeeze shooter, our captive deer research facility. These, these students in a short time begin to find different niches that are interesting to them. Maybe it's diseases. They wanna study wildlife diseases. Maybe they wanna be a communicator in wildlife. We've got a broad array of areas that they can specialize in. It can be anything from extreme field work like habitat management to lab work. And they're able to find that if they're in the proper program. And so we, we want this great foundation and we need to make an indelible mark on these students while they're here. And non-governmental organizations like NDA can be really helpful too. Like you hear Kip talking about your field of fork program. It's, it's mind blowing for these people that aren't, um, that didn't grow up in hunting to experience this. And for our students here at the university, we've got an academics of field program, which NDA also supports. Georgia Department of Natural Resources also supports it. Why? Because they want biologists that are being hired out of our university to at minimum understand and appreciate that hunting is an important part of conservation. And so these students are exposed to a variety of hunting. Like we just did mentored uh, deer hunt on November 20th. One of my favorite days of the year. We get out, get in the stand, They've already been at the range. They've already been educated about deer biology and they have an opportunity to possibly harvest a deer, quarter that animal, learn more about its biology right there with that animal in hand and take it home and appreciate that venison. So at minimum, we hope through this program, they'll gain a, an appreciation that's lifelong and hopefully they'll become participants. But at least if they're out there in the workforce, they'll understand hunting at a greater level than they would have in just the classroom setting. And graduate work is almost imperative in our field today. So think about these students, they go through their bachelor's degree for four years, and then graduate work can be anywhere from two to 10 years beyond that. But that graduate um, experience is so essential. That's where they get exposure to applied management and they work hands-on often right next to biologists and researchers that are trying to solve real world problems. Our graduate students are funded on grants from state and federal agencies primarily, and you'll see some of those projects in a little bit. Our students, it's a, quite a good deal. They get a full tuition waiver. They're also paid an assistantship, 20 to $25,000 a year to go to class and conduct their research. The results from their research projects are then directly applied to management and so when these students finish their graduate degrees, they are equipped to tackle additional real world problems. You see that they get to do lots of fun field work, including you know, actually getting their hands on animals or doing lab work, whatever it may be. 
but they also get exposure, extreme exposure to communication, both in professional and public audiences, so that they can relate to those constituents that they're going to serve um, when they get out of school. Next, we're going to explore some of the research we're doing here at UGA. Like I said, we're going to talk about nine of my graduate students and their current studies. I hope that you'll think about young people that you know, or maybe some of you that want an encore career in wildlife and how you might get involved in this kind of work. Let's talk about my very first student when I returned here to University of Georgia and started my academic career as an assistant professor, Adam Edge. Adam um, is still here. He, he was working on his master's and we transitioned him to a, a PhD program, a doctoral program, because he was such a major player on this large scale um, deer research project that we're conducting. Adam's from the hills of Kentucky. He, he loves squirrel hunting and deer hunting. And he also grew a love for um, the continent of Africa. He traveled there during his bachelor's degree and he conducted research on elephants. So he was really well skilled and stepped right into the research project um, with, the, with a solid skill set on day one. And what we're looking at is um, a population of deer in North Georgia in the Appalachians that has been in drastic decline over the last decade, likely due to lack of habitat management on national forests. But we also see an increase in predators, bobcats, coyotes, and bears really taking their toll on this population. And so Adam's portion of the research is to study in GPS collared does, um, handle their fawns, put collars on those fawns, track the survival, determine what's killing animals, looking at their reproductive rates and their movements, particularly their movements and their habitat use relative to what deer are surviving and what habitats are they using. Those deer that survive and prosper, are they utilizing habitats adjacent to national forests on private lands? And these are some of the questions that Adam's looking at right now. He and several other students have worked on this project and we're feeding this information to the Georgia DNR, and they are adapting regulations as our findings come out. In fact, they stopped antlerless harvest on national forests in North Georgia in 2020 due to these drastic declines in some of our early findings. Jordan Youngman comes from uh, upstate New York, and he went to a, a small liberal arts college in New York, but he did have a good foundation in biology. He worked for me in Minnesota, did a great job, I gave him a, a strong recommendation to go to Mississippi State, and he worked with Dr. Steve Damaris there. He grew his skill set, learning genetic techniques, so in the laboratory, um, and so he was perfectly poised for a project that um, that's sponsored by South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. They wanted to know the abundance of coyotes throughout the state of South Carolina, so that they could adapt deer harvest regulations relative to what's known to be the greatest predator of white-tailed deer in South Carolina, coyotes. And so Jordan's skill set is extremely well suited for this work. He and his technicians collect scat, so coyote poop, on roadways. And using these genetic techniques that he's developed, he's able to identify individual coyotes and use some complex statistics to capture, essentially, we know this is this animal's poop, and recapture those individuals to look at those, those differences in rates and estimate the number of coyotes in a region. He's also looking at a big data set from three states on coyotes and how coyotes move through the landscape as they're hunting. What areas are they foraging in at different times of the year? For instance, we found that coyotes move to big woods areas during the spring when fawn mortality is at its greatest. It appears that they're actually adapting their behaviors and returning to these areas where they expect to find fawns. Also, Jordan's using uh, genetic techniques to identify the diets of coyotes, gray foxes, and bobcats in South Carolina. It used to be we'd sort through scat and identify seeds and bone matter, et cetera. But today we're able to use these advanced techniques to identify a whole laundry list of species, everything from snakes to birds that coyotes are eating, as well as deer and, and turkeys and, and other game species. Amanda Van Buskirk is a bit of a different sort of wildlife student. And I think we'll see more Amandas and I welcome them, honestly. I recruited Amanda highly from Penn State. 
She has a background in mathematics and statistics. She worked with Dwayne Diefenbach, who you've also seen here on these webinars in Pennsylvania to develop techniques for, for estimating white-tailed deer uh, relative to localized reduction. So I recruited Amanda to come work with my colleagues here at University of Georgia and I on what I think is one of the most important research projects that we're doing. Now, you and I, hopefully, we report our harvest of deer every year as required, whatever state we're in. Most states require that we report whatever deer we harvest and their age and sex. Not everybody does that. And that's really difficult in terms of management. It's hard to estimate what a population was based on harvest if you don't know exactly what the harvest was. You don't know how to change regulations to improve populations toward goals if we don't know what harvest is. And so Amanda is studying various streams of data. I mean, her, her job is 100% computer time and working with people. It's not out there in the field to estimate trends in deer populations relative to people's preferences. So she's conducting questionnaires. You may see questionnaires from her in the future to understand your preferences for deer management relative to population size. All this work is in the state of Georgia. And Georgia's deer management program will be able to use her work to put best management, management practices in place to use information from our stakeholders to improve management. And so Amanda, who, who never hunted before, certainly never touched a gun. Every year we've had, we have a sporting clays event and there's Amanda last year practicing in advance of the Sporting Clays event so that she can be part of our field to understand what hunters do. Those excise taxes on sporting arms and ammunition that she's got in her hand are driving her research and she wanted to appreciate that more. And so people like Amanda, maybe not what you'd think of as the traditional wildlife student are doing a lot of great things. Marcelo George came from us from Virginia Tech. He worked with Dr. Mike Cherry on a variety of projects, but particularly on um, a deer project in, um, in Virginia, looking at the use of prescribed fire um, and the effects on wildlife habitat, deer, songbirds, et cetera. Marcelo um, is not native to the US. He, he grew up in, in Brazil and in various um, parts of the US. And he comes to us with the skill set as a non traditional hunter. Um, Marcelo got involved in hunting not until he got in graduate school. And today, Marcelo appreciates um, being able to harvest deer and feed he and his wife with the venison he harvests on his own property and public lands. And also, Marcelo's research is some very important work that we're doing in Arkansas. Unfortunately, Arkansas has widespread CWD, or I should say very high prevalence of CWD in a region in Northwest Arkansas. And what we're doing there is studying, very similar to our North Georgia deer project, collaring does, collaring their fawns, collaring bucks, looking at their survival, movements, condition, indices, et cetera, relative to their chronic wasting disease status. So we're actually targeting the collaring of these animals so that we can understand how those populations are gonna change as deer that are CWD positive will absolutely succumb to the disease and die and drop out of the population and not be available for harvest. And so Arkansas uh, Game and Fish Commission is gonna use this information to change regulations for hunting in the state, to change um, perhaps their approach to habitat management, and a whole host of, of other things that are gonna change the landscape of hunting, hopefully to make sure that we've got deer that are available for recreational harvest and be an important part of, of the ecosystem. So Marcelo's strong suits, I mean, he's great in the field, phenomenal at catching deer, but he can also code the heck out of computer programs. And, and he can develop complex statistical models to estimate deer movements, to estimate population parameters like survival and reproduction so that we can build models to estimate where these populations are going relative to chronic wasting disease. Blaze Newman is um, from Oklahoma. And so we give her some grief about being a flatlander, but Blaze is adapted well. She went to Colorado State 
um, for her undergraduate degree working with small mammals. And, um, and then she went on to Clemson and studied the physiology of bats in torpor, so those that are essentially hibernating. Blaze's um, interest in, in physiology and the ecology of wildlife species was really a perfect fit for the project she's working on, which is um, the visual ecology of white-tailed deer. I wanna send a, a shout out to our sponsor, Sika Gear. It's a no strings attached grant that they've provided us for Blaze's research to simply advance our understanding of how deer perceive the world visually. Now, of course, some of that information might feed into their camouflage lines down the road, but it's essentially, uh, uh, as I said, just a wholehearted investment in research, an investment in Blaze, an investment in our program. And so right now, actually tomorrow morning, I'll be out at our deer barns, Blaze and David Osborne and a whole host of collaborators for the last two weeks have been um, exposing the deer visual system. You see a deer that's sedated here um, in, on the screen. She's got a little cone here giving her oxygen while she's under sedation. And they're exposing her eye to different wavelengths of light um, under different lighting intensity. So think dawn, dusk, full daylight conditions to see how those deer uh, perceive wavelengths of color under those different lighting conditions. She'll also study the reflective structure of the deer eye, call it the pedum, um, across the nation to see how latitude and other conditions affect uh, the anatomy of the deer eye. And also Blaze has taken a, um, a big data set that we had from Central Florida of buck movements. And we've, we've used that data set for other research, but she's taken it in a different context. And she's looking at how deer, these bucks use habitat during dawn, dusk, daylight conditions, well, so relative to weather patterns, to see how these differing light environments, think about in the summertime, right? Open areas are extremely bright versus the forest might have a more dappled appearance. Where do deer prefer to move during very specific conditions as they change throughout the day? How is that light environment impacting their visual system and causing them to use different habitats? Some really exciting stuff. And She's, she's showing some excellent results. Patrick Grunewald comes from us from a, a small cheese factory town in Wisconsin. I, I give Patrick a hard time about using his pump 30 odd six there with iron sights, but the proof is in the pudding. This year, Patrick's harvested a bear in North Georgia with his iron sights, several deer here in the Piedmont. Last year, he harvested a feral pig with his iron sights. So he's pretty deadly with that. Patrick comes from um, University of Wisconsin Stevens Point, which is a real practical program that gives great hands-on experience to their students. And then Patrick traveled throughout the country working on a variety of projects, particularly with ungulates, deer, elk, bighorn sheep, et cetera. So he had a diverse background in animal capture techniques, which fit perfectly with some of the needs of Georgia Department of Natural Resources. They wanted us to test different drug combinations that they might be able to safely use to mobilize deer in essentially downtown Atlanta. Could their personnel use some of these new formulations with, um, that have less restrictions but still be effective in capturing deer? And so I know I had a bit of a sexy title for my presentation, Drugs and Tasers. I'm sure you were thinking about some nefarious things, but I, I drew this from Patrick's research. Now, why would we want to use a conducted electrical weapon to mobilize deer, essentially a taser? It sounds cruel. I'll tell you that it's not. We are studying the behavior of deer, the stress levels of deer, the physiological responses of deer relative to being tasered for five and 15 seconds. Why would we want to do that? Well, in Atlanta and the metropolitan area of Georgia and many other metropolitan areas, deer get themselves in emergency situations. Think of that deer that gets on the school bus, that goes in the grocery store, gets caught on a fence, and it's difficult to handle that animal. You can't shoot them safely and, and euthanize them in a situation like that. Often drugs aren't readily available to mobilize them, but most law enforcement personnel are carrying tasers today. And we're finding that tasers have really no physiological negative effects on these deer, that, that lasts more than a day or two. And 
the, the taser is extremely effective to immobilize an animal for either capturing them and removing them from the situation or putting them in a setting where we can safely euthanize them with a backstop of soft earth versus imagine a deer hanging up in a fence and thrashing around or a deer that's been hit on the side of the road, unfortunately, which happens very often and you can't safely euthanize them and they compromise the safety of themselves as well as, as humans in the area. And so this is some really applied work that we're doing hand in hand with Georgia Department of Natural Resources. Emma Kring comes from uh, Pennsylvania like Kip and I. Emma, like Patrick, traveled throughout the country working on a variety of field projects. And she developed an extreme interest in wildlife diseases. And she regularly communicated with uh, one of our sister agencies here, Southeastern Cooperative Wildlife Disease Study, as a conduit between state agencies, Missouri and Nebraska, um, as a conduit with those states and SQUIDUS about some of the disease issues that were occurring in those states. And SQUIDUS essentially handpicked Emma to work on a 40 year data set. I'm co advising her with Dr. Mark Ruder from the Southeastern Cooperative Wildlife Disease Study. And Emma is modeling these trends in hemorrhagic disease across the Great Plains states. So some of us might hear modeling statistical techniques and, and think it's boring, but imagine the benefits of understanding what weather variables, what land characteristics drive hemorrhagic disease, and can we predict when these outbreaks are going to occur? You may have heard about some of the extreme die-offs of, of deer late summer due to hemorrhagic disease and blue tongue virus. If we can predict when these die-offs are gonna occur, we can adjust regulations in more real time so that we don't over harvest a population and further suppress it when the population's already been pushed down by these uh, disease risks. So some really important work that Emma's doing. And I hope that when she steps out of our walls, she'll walk right into a disease bios biologist position for a state because she's got a really practical skill set that will benefit state or federal agencies quite well. We've got some other upcoming research. You see here Shane Bone, he's from Minnesota, just up the road from where I lived in Minnesota. He had a great foundation from University of Minnesota Crookston. Shane was involved in all kinds of wildlife projects there. And then he came to work in metropolitan Atlanta as a wildlife technician. So professionally, day to day, Shane's working with everything you see him here with the affiliated woodpecker to uh, removing deer from a fence, um, darting bears in a tree, everything like that. And Georgia DNR identified along with us an opportunity for Shane to work on a research project where we're going to do some human dimensions research. So we're going to question residents of suburban, um, urban, and semi-rural residential communities to understand their perceptions of deer populations, their preferences for managing deer populations. And we're going to build decision, um, essentially decision trees, to help those residents, those community associations, to make decisions along with the state on how they should manage their deer. So it's not, you know, out in, in, in middle America where we don't have issues with deer, we're talking about deer that are getting themselves into trouble every day, but yet a great recreational resource. We see some of the biggest bucks um, in our state coming out of metropolitan Atlanta. So getting those deer populations in line with society and ecosystems will have great benefits for years to come. And finally, our last student, um, you see Jack DeRochers here. He's actually in one of my classes right now. He's going to walk right into a master's program. And Jack's program is a little bit different. It's a non-thesis master's, meaning that he won't have this big document when he's all done. But he's going to do practical work right alongside undergraduates to develop a course um, that will be co-taught by me and another professor here on how to use podcasting to inform the public about science. And so we're gonna talk with graduate students on, in a podcast se session about their research so that we can take that information to the masses just like we're doing here today. As you can see, Jack's a bit of a fire bug. He loves prescribed fire. And he's hoping to take this communication, um, these communication strategies 
to, um, to his future life. He wants to be a consultant that uses prescribed fire and he wants to inform the public about prescribed fire. So not only will the agencies that will give this information to and the university students that will benefit from the classes, but Jack will be able to take more information to the masses more effectively through this sort of communication when he's all done. So this is my last little bit, my last pitch. Think about that person at your church. Think about your grandchild that might have an interest in wildlife management. All these people that you see here in this slide had never hunted before they were involved in this academics of field program. Look through, through those masks and see those smiling faces. I can tell you, this is my favorite day of the year when we take people deer hunting. And these students are here in our program and were never exposed to hunting before. But because of this, and because of their exposure to these research projects that they work on, all those nine students have undergraduates working on their research. We've instilled in these people an appreciation for management. And with that, I welcome you to check out our website and contact us at the UGA Deer Lab and Kip will tell me what questions we have. Um, Kip, should I stop sharing my screen now? Yep, go ahead and uh, stop sharing, and uh, that way we'll have you front and center. And uh, great job, you know, very well done. Folks, uh, any questions you have, go ahead and put those in the Q&A, and then uh, I'll draw from that and uh, to ask Gino. But, but I actually have the first one, Gino, and that's uh, um, really cool stuff that you have going on there. I've always been amazed at just the sheer number of graduate students at the, the University of Georgia and the wildlife program. Now, I've been fortunate to, to be at your, your deer pens on numerous occasions. Um, much of the work that you just talked about here is stuff that, that's not being done there. Um, obviously, the vision stuff is. And um, my question is, I know when I was in graduate school at the University of New Hampshire, we had a deer research facility. Maine used to have a deer research facility. There was deer research facilities at numerous organizations or numerous uh, universities that are no longer there. So my question is, um, how's the, you know, the lab there, the deer facility at University of Georgia? Is it alive and well? Um, hopefully it is the case, but uh, what can you tell us about the, the deer facility? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, Kip, I, I came up at, at Penn State's deer research facility. I lived and worked there. It was integral to my training. And so I have a great appreciation, appreciation for deer research facilities. We are alive and well. I mean, it takes quite an effort to keep the doors open. We've got several research projects. You saw the vision. We're doing the taser work, the drug work there. We're about to do some trainings for Georgia Department of Natural Resources at our facility. And so it's alive and well. And I'll tell you, it's, it's no more alive and well than the, the heart of us, which is our undergraduates. Every semester we've got undergraduates that volunteer to work at the facility to gain skills. And so right now we've got seven or eight undergrads that rotate and schedule, helping to feed the deer, help with general husbandry, help us with the research projects, and they're getting practical experience. And to be honest, I watch those students. Those are the ones that are volunteering. Um, they're, they're taking time out of their week to, uh, to help us out. And I say, oh, that student right there is one that we need to get in graduate school. That's one that we need on our research project out in the field in Arkansas. And so it's a great proving grounds for people to, to get exposure to deer, but also to gain experience and, you know, uh, uh, an independence, I should say, because they're out there and they're responsible for upwards of 60 deer a day in, in their care. Let me ask this, I'll follow it up with, I know when, when I came out of graduate school, uh, the wildlife field was extremely competitive. Uh, at that point, essentially, you went to work for a state or a federal agency. There was, there was very little other opportunities. Um, how is that today? I, I get calls from a lot of aspiring students uh, to say, hey, you know what, what is the job field like? Um, I, I know how I answer that, but uh, you are much closer to that to me, though. Uh, folks who are going to school today to, to, to be wildlife biologists, what is the job outlook? Is it, is it any less competitive than in the past or, or not? I, I'll say it's, it's looking pretty good. I'm on a variety of job boards. <laughs> and, um, you know, those that, that come out with their undergrad, they, their four-year degree, they're often traveling around getting these technician experiences. And those that have done well in school and proved well in the field, they're 
jumping into graduate programs. Many of our undergrads that have graduated in the last two years are in graduate programs, whether it's here, Texas A&M or other programs. And so that suggests that things are going very well in terms of our training. But I'm also seeing folks get long-term positions in state and federal government, and as well as the private industry. Like in South Georgia, we've got some uh, private plantations um, that are 50,000 plus acres that are employing managers. And I see many of our students go into positions like that sometimes then jumping off into their own consulting. And so, yeah, I encourage people to get into this field and I wholeheartedly mean it because we have job opportunities that I'm seeing coming across my desk on a daily basis um, and certainly plenty of grad school opportunities. That is awesome. That, that is great. Obviously, you and I have spent a long time in this in this field, and, and I certainly, I have loved every day of this. Um, and what I tell folks is, um, yes, it's actually, there's still, it's still competitive, but, you know, I think there are more opportunities today simply because we have so many consulting opportunities that weren't there before. There's more NGO opportunities. And, uh, man, if you, you know, you go through a program like you guys have at UGA, you know, and get that level of education that really sets you apart and uh, positions you well to step into to be able to do the type of thing, you know, that you want, whether that be deer related or some other wildlife related, and whether it be modeling related, computer related, GIS, habitat or whatever, uh, there's there's a lot out there. And uh, fortunately, there's the, the, uh, the academic institutions like UGA that does put people at the top of their game coming out. Yeah, I'll say that there's a lot of federal money out there right now you'll see a lot of farm bill biologist positions across the u.s and those are people that get to work right alongside agricultural producers and small communities to put habitat on the ground so really fulfilling work it's not sitting behind a desk all the time certainly there's some desk time but um, those conservation programs are being put to practice and people are getting good practical experiences um, as biologists Let me, let me ask this. I know that uh, when you and I were in school, it was a very much a hook and bullet crowd. You know, people, you know, just died in the wool, hunters and anglers. Um, then there was a period where we really moved away from some of the hardcore game management stuff into more conservation biology related stuff where, you know, it was, it was a lot of Central America work and grad work. Uh, where are we today? Are we seeing the pendulum come back, swing back a little bit and seeing more people Maybe not necessarily folks who grew up in a hunting or angling family, but more people interested in some more of the consumptive part of this. Are we seeing that swing back a little bit or are we still kind of away from the traditional hook and bullet crowd? Well, I, I'll say we still have our hook and bullet contingent like like you and I, but more of the people that come into our program, sort of as I tried to allude to, they're getting interested in these other facets of management and actual hands-on application. For instance, today we had a a symposium with Georgia DNR and our students from Warnell School of Forestry and Natural Resources. And so there's a whole host of talks, everything from largemouth bass management to deer management to uh, salamander management. And so for instance, they're managing habitats intensively and actually restocking salamanders to improve populations that aren't doing well. Now think about, well, maybe that's not hook and bullets, right? What are those salamanders feeding? Well, all sorts of wildlife and all sorts of sport fish. Mm. And so what I'll say is our program is very applied. And I'll say mainly here in the U.S., across the Southeast in particular. And so there's a lot of like, I love that problem solving piece. And I think that that's what our students enjoy is to see where this, this research goes and is applied to management. I see a question here Very from an, good. Uh, an old friend. We have friend. another question here. Gino said. I was going yeah. to read it. I see it. Uh, how do we more effectively translate? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. You can read it. And then uh, that way everybody knows exactly what you're answering. So uh, go ahead, read it, and then uh, answer it for us. All right. I'm sorry. We got a little delay with your, your backcountry Pennsylvania internet. So I'll go ahead and read it. How do we more effectively translate wildlife research to the general public? with a growing trend towards urbanized areas and likely a greater disconnect of individuals from the land. Well, one thing that you and I can, can appreciate 
Andy, is that um, there are plenty of wildlife species that adapt very well to urban areas. And whether it's kids in elementary school, middle school, ag ed classes, um, to even, even downtown colleges can find urban parks and neighborhoods where they can study and appreciate wildlife. But I do think that one thing that's really important about our program and others, I'm sure like yours, is that we take students on field trips. We may stuff them in a van and put them on the road for a week long process of seeing all sorts of habitats, those that are managed well, those that may not be managed quite as well, seeing a whole host of species, talking with different landowners. And so it's really important for us to not only extend our information to the public, going into schools, getting on PBS, getting on YouTube, but also to take people out. Like for instance, we've got a great continuing ed program here. That's people that um, they could be foresters or wildlife people, wild, wildlife biologists that need extensive training, but it can also be members of the public that participate. And we can take them out and show them habitat management in action, show them wildlife management on the ground, take them to our deer research facility and talk about some of our research. So I think it goes both ways, taking it to them and taking them to where they might experience something, something new, whether it's students or the general public. Very good. Well, we got about five minutes before the top of the hour. We're going to go ahead and, uh, and thank you, Gino, for, for the great uh, presentation and then conversation afterwards. And I'll tell everybody here, uh, I, I hope that, uh, that everybody listening is an NDA member. If not, I certainly would hope that you would, would uh, consider joining. You can go right to the website and join at, at the deerassociation.com. Nobody fights harder for deer and deer hunters' rights. So uh, we would, if you're not a member, we would certainly love for you to entertain becoming a member. Uh, I'll announce uh, next month's webinar. This will be on January 12th. So remember, the second Wednesday of the month, our speaker will be Mark Turner. Mark is a, a doctorate candidate at the University of Tennessee. Uh, Mark has written for, for Quality Whitetails for us uh, numerous times. He's actually uh, going to be handling uh, our food plot species profile going forward. You will see his first uh, first uh, edition here in, uh, in our spring edition or the next issue of Quality Whitetails. Uh, he studies under Dr. Craig Harper at the University of Tennessee. Mark was actually one of our very first interns uh, that we ever had back when he was uh, an undergraduate student. But uh, he works on Habitat Matters. So his talk is on Quality Matters, uh, Forage Nutrition for Deer. So that is our, our January webinar. And now it's time for a prize giveaway. As I said, uh, this will be the NDA trailer hitch. Uh, that we can send uh, anywhere in the United States. So the answer for this, we're going to put this one in the chat, and I'm going to open the chat up right now so uh, that you can see this here. Um, to answer this in the chat, first person with the correct answer wins this. Gino shared a lot of great information with us about all the different projects that he has going on with his graduate students, where they're from, kind of their backgrounds, some of the sponsors. Uh, the one that I picked here is... Uh, in addition to drugs, what are Gino's researchers using to immobilize deer? Very first one in is, get back to the top here, this is the correct answer, tasers, very well done, Andrew Bram. So uh, congratulations, Andrew. You, uh, you win the other questions I was going to ask that I thought it was going to be, but when we hit that part of it, I thought, oh no, this has got to be what the question is. So uh, super cool research with that. So uh, Andrew, here's what I need you to do. My email address is kip at deerassociation.com. That's one P, K-I-P at deerassociation.com. Email me your mailing address and uh, we will have this on its way to you uh, tomorrow. So uh, with that, I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, share this with, with others. Enjoy this. Tell your friends uh, that they can go to the YouTube channel and, and be able to see this as well. Uh, certainly wish everybody a good rest of your deer season. I know we have some folks on here that the, the best part of your seasons haven't even started yet. Some of our friends are in the deep south, uh, particularly the Gulf South. For us here in Pennsylvania, we got a few days left and uh, we're going we're gonna to hunt hard all the way to the end. Gino, good luck with you the rest of the season. I know uh, you've had some fun so far. 
I hope you get to field a bunch more. And uh, certainly it's December when hunting season's over. Let's make sure we spend some time with family over the holidays. So uh, Merry Christmas, everybody. Certainly appreciate you being here tonight. And uh, be safe and good luck the rest of the deer season. We'll see you.